I yeah, I would like to um, introduce the ecotermology. Um, so because we are all here biotermologists, I don't need to uh, emphasize that biotermology uh, how cool it is, and uh, that Peggy Andreas uh, published a paper and defined the biotermology and everything. And uh, not uh, long ago, also two other things were uh, published and defined in the publications, and this was Soundscape, um, uh, where Pianowski and co-workers in 2011 published and uh, the paper about sound, soundscape and uh, Swear and Farina published in 2015 the paper about ecoacoustics, where they defined the, the area. Um, so we kind of followed this uh, um, path, and uh, uh, in the last biotermology book, we published a chapter where we also defined the vibroscape. And here, um, I, I want to uh, uh, emphasize that we uh, uh, define the vibroscape as the, um, all the vibration that are present in an environment, and then can be of biological vibrations, geophysical vibrations, or anthropogenic vibrations. And in the talk that will follow, we will mostly be um, focusing on these biological vibrations. Uh, among these biological vibrations, we include vibrational signals. So the signals that animals use to communicate. Um, um, then the incidental vibrations, the vibrations that are produced by animal movements, feeding, and other activity. Then one very important part is the vibrational component of airborne sound, and also the plant acoustic emission. Uh, so, um, what you need to do the ecotermology study, uh, it's very simple. You need the environment and you need the sensor. In our case, the environment was this meadow on the photo uh, and the sensor was the laser vibrometer. This area, this meadow from, the, from air looks like this. Uh, the important here is that it was very close to the house so we can have the electricity uh, um, uh, uh, available. Um, of course, when you do this study, you need to bring a lot of stuff to the field. You, we brought the laser vibrometers, computers, sound cards, other instruments to measure the abiotic factors. We also uh, have students there to help us. We stay there day and night to record different things that we want. And what we did, uh, it was very simple. We just uh, put a reflective foil on the plant and point the laser beam of the laser vibrometer to this reflective foil, and we were recording uh, <coughs> vibroscape on the spot. Um, after the recording, um, this long, long processing <laughs> process of analyzing things came, and uh, uh, this was actually listening to these recordings and annotating the events on the recordings. On the, on the spectrogram, we annotate every event and we categorize all these events to different categories. The, the, the largest category was the vib uh, was so-called vibrotypes. Um, after this was done, uh, we get uh, very large tables and that to, and we use them for the further analysis. Uh, so I already mentioned the vibrational type uh, or VT. In total, we got uh, 56 of them. Uh, here is just a presentation how diverse they can be. And in on those vibro types, we we um, we calculate two things. One is richness. So this is number of different VT and the abundance, the total duration of VT, everything can be calculated according to time scale or whatever. Um, so, and uh, we actually um, um, get, uh, 
set goals and these were like to observe seasonal changes daily changes uh, uh, how is with short uh, uh, temporal coordination of uh, these events in on the recordings and what is the special distribution so let's first look at the seasonal changes of course we avoid the the, the winter i just don't like uh, winter so we avoid recording in winter uh, so we record things from the beginning of uh, may to end beginning of october when we when the activity in the vibroscape drop only to almost to zero so we said okay the winter period <laughs> starts here um on the upper uh, box plot you can see the all uh, biological vibrations together this also includes the um the incidental vibration of movements and feeding and also the vibrational component of uh, of uh, bird songs mainly so the acoustic signals the, the biggest difference between biological vibrations the abundance of biological vibrations and the abundance of vibrational signals is in spring period uh, where you can observe this difference uh, due to a high amount of bird songs um, then the 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 highest uh, amount of vibrational signals is in the uh, beginning of july and then dropping till october october here are the three uh, spectrograms where you can observe three different um, seasons spring summer and autumn in spring as already mentioned we have many bird songs uh, in orange and also some vts uh, then summer, where the lots of uh, vibrational signals is present, and some of them are also overlapping. And then the autumn uh, autumn period, where we have few vibrational types and some strange events that we couldn't actually know what it is. So if we put these uh, seasons more uh, in numbers, we can see that the um, and we and if we look at the richness and abundance we see that in spring we have uh, low richness and the low abundance then early summer the richness rise and the average abundance is enormously high and then the late summer where we still have the high richness and still high abundance but it's much lower than in the early summer and then the autumn when the average richness and the abundance drop uh, significantly. So um, for this study, we did recordings for three hours every 10 to 14 days. Uh, depends on the weather because we were choosing like nice weather. And uh, we kind of calculate the accumulation curves and we see that uh, even uh, in that in three hours, none of almost none of the re, uh, curves reach the plateau so if we would record it longer we would expect more different vts um, but still even if the vibroscape was undersampled we could observe with the nmds analyze uh, analysis we could observe these differences among the seasons so the spring the early summer late summer and the autumn were all separated uh, talking about the richness and the abundance, uh, we also compare those two things and we saw no correlation between them. So the richness and the abundance during the season did not correlate. Uh, here the, the richness is presented in columns and the abundance in the, in the blue dots. So uh, moving to day and night, day cycle. Um, for this reason we stay in the in the meadow for the whole 24 hours three days in a row and this was in the mid uh, in the peak season so in the beginning of july uh, at the end we figure out this is just too much recordings we cannot analyze everything it's just too much we pick up just half an hour period uh, uh, in different time time um, of the day so we choose midnight at one o'clock in the in the night five o'clock in the morning was sunrise then nine o'clock was morning one o'clock in the afternoon was midday afternoon five o'clock in the afternoon 
and the sun set at nine o'clock. And if we look how the activity went, we see that uh, during the sun, uh, midnight and sunrise and sunset, the activity was very low. At midnight, actually almost zero, so no activity was um, um, recorded there. Uh, you can see how this green line goes up and down, and the top uh, values are in the afternoon. Uh, the blue line here shows the temperature the, that was also measured in the same um, meadow. And you can see that the correlation is quite strong. So actually the correlation between the temperature and the abundance of the vibrational events on the meadow was uh, 0.8, uh, so quite strong. So we kind of su suggest that the temperature is this limiting factor and that, um, that cause more of vibrational events happening during the day. <clears throat> Later, we also look to the short temporal coordination. On this graph, you can see um, all the all the vibrational types listed on the y-axis um, and on x uh, axis. This is time, but from this graph, you can't see much. This is like three hours recording. Uh, from 9th of July. Um, because you can't see much from this uh, graph, uh, we start thinking, okay, we annotate everything, everything on our recording. So we have these rectangles over every uh, signal that we observed and categorized. So we decide to calculate the overlap in time and overlap in time and frequency uh, from this this uh, data, so uh, so this was done with R, and yeah, we found we we found out the observed value. So the observed value was the value of overlap um, that was present in the recording, but we didn't know what to do with this number. It didn't tell us a lot, so we think okay, uh, we have this three-hour recording. Let's uh, and we have this amount of uh, vibrational events in these three hours. So we decide to randomly distribute this uh, amount, the same amount of events um, in this same amount of three hours recording. And to gain the, the statistical power, we repeat this a thousand times. And we found out that the, our observed value from the recording from the nature uh, the overlap there was much, much lower than it was calculated by this random distribution of the uh, events in the same time. Um, uh, this was observed uh, like in overlap over time and frequency and overlap just in time. So uh, then we said, okay, let's look at the broader scale. Let's take all the recordings from the early uh, summer uh, because we have here the recordings that consist of a lot of uh, vibrational activity and also the recordings with less activity. And we did the, the same, uh, same things. And we observed that in the recording from the beginning of June and end of July, where the, amount, the abundance of uh, vibrational types was lower, uh, we couldn't observe this effect of... Um, uh, of um, less um, overlap in the in the observed. Uh, so the the red point that shows the observed uh, amount of overlap than than in our randomly distributed um, um, stimulation. We could observe this with statistical significant uh, p value only in the in the event only on the recordings that have higher amounts. So this suggests that uh, when there is a lot of vibrational activity, the animals do distribute the time. Um, yeah, in time, they distribute their signaling activity in time in this short pattern. So just, <clears throat> just avoiding overlapping. Then we also look to frequency distribution because we know that this phenomena is well known from the acoustic uh, world where, uh, where animals divide their signals in frequency. And we here 
the frequency range with box plots and the dominant frequency range with black dots is presented for all the vibra vibrational type from this same recording from the beginning of July. And you can see that we have one very special, and this is P3, and we were very lucky because we could uh, specify the, the, the species, and this is Megophthalmus scanicus, a small leaf hopper uh, that produced this uh, kind of unique uh, um, uh, signals that have this high, um, high frequency range. Um, and because we already know that we have all, all these recordings annotated, uh, we decide to calculate the overlap again in time and overlap in time and frequency. And because these two overlaps are kind of um, um, one is part of another because one has overlap in time and then the other is time and frequency. We, we expected that this linear model of those two overlaps will be quite linear. And it was. Uh, um, so all the data points were almost on the line, except this, our T3, um, so Megophthalmus scanicus uh, <coughs> signal was on the border of a 25% um, confidential interval of Mahalanobis distance from this linear model. And it was moved to the, um, uh, so it overlaps uh, in time much more than it would be expected how much it overlaps in time and frequency. So it, it kind of suggests that it might not be so, um, so coordinated with others because it used it, uh, this vibrotype used di different frequencies, so it might be less, um, yeah, um, less strict about the time coordination with others. And then the last thing we do it was, uh, and this was done, uh, the the measurements and the analysis was done by Beaky that is listening. Uh, now, and this is the special spatial distribution. So for this, um, we use the same metal. And in the same metal, we spotted three locations, three different locations. On each location, we, um, we have two different species of, uh, of plants. One was Gallium molugo and the other was Carex hirta. And on this metal, we recorded um, viroscape from, uh, from this Plant. And when and when we did the NMDS ana analysis, we figure out that they separate quite nice. So the gallium molugo uh, has totally different uh, vibroscape composition than Carex hirta. Uh, but this distribution was not observed uh, over mm -hmm. the locations. Numbers here on on graph shows the locations and the letter shows the, the species of plants. So the um, different species of plants have different vibroscape composition. Uh, further, we also looked at what, how is that with the abundance of, of vibroscape um, or of VT on these plants. And we see that on, in Carex hirta, each location have different abundance. So in location one, the abundance was higher, and then in location three, the abundance was the lowest. But we couldn't observe this on Gallium molugo plant. Uh, what's the reason? It, we need more, <laughs> more experiments to be done or more measurements. So yeah, um, that's something very interesting. So just to quickly sum up, like uh, we kind of, uh, check the seasonal changes and observe them. We also uh, observe the daily changes over day and night. Uh, we've kind of figured out that uh, short temporal uh, coordination of animals um, is present in the nature. And we also uh, show uh, dis spatial distribution of, of uh, different vi uh, vibroscape on different uh, plant species. So to really sum up, uh, I think the ecotremology is really a good um, um, 
principe or whatever to study the vibrations, to investigate the biodiversity and other ecological questions. Uh, so to study the environment that is around us, that even if we can't sense things, we can still observe some processes that are going on and, and stuff. So yeah, um, I hope that this will inspire more people to go to the nature, to record stuff and to, to observe things. So at the end, I would just like to thank to everyone at our department. Um, I'm very glad to be uh, part of this group. And yeah, uh, now, uh, if any questions, I will be very glad to, to answer.